Well, hi everyone, and uh, welcome back to yet another of these uh, nightly title practice videos. So, um, last time I started building a function that, um, you know, did, uh, basically I made this little function to polysequence that took a string and then did the whole like angle brackets percent syntax around it to do like polysequencing. Why did we need that? Because we wanted to try using this whole Lindenmeyer system function, which does really cool stuff in terms of generating like a a really large, kind of hard to predict just by looking at it string of uh, uh, basically a very 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 large string, you know, arbitrarily large essentially that you can make out of um, describing systems that are kind of like a context free grammar. And so, like, that was, that was really cool. Um, I talked a bit, a bit about how that was something that uh, I, uh, Mike Hodnick introduced me to the Lindemeyer function, but mostly I've only used it like the examples where, um, you know, you just slow it a whole bunch and try to manage the size of the pattern. I wanted to use it for polysequencing. And then where we ended uh, last time was like, okay, well, you can do that. And I sort of live life coded the life coding and um, showed how you can take a, you can write a little function like that's what this was here the Lindemeyer number to sounds and I just mapped you know the indexes to samples and stuff and then used unwords to turn it into an actual reasonable pattern and that was fine that was fine like but but the real sticking point is this this part right like the idea that we have to define like these cases manually, that would stink in practice. Like you don't want to be doing that live coding, right? I don't know about you, but I get pretty easily mind flooded. Um, I don't, um, I recently tried to live code while um, reading from a script uh, and that that went horribly. Like it's it's really easy to, to you know, it's hard to, to code and do other things at the same time if you're having to like think of your next musical steps and remember to write all the cases in a function correctly that's eh, that doesn't sound fun so that's that brings us to today now i i didn't i'm not live coding this in front of you because this is actually something i built piecemeal over the day while i was doing other work just kind of trying things and and stuff so I'll show you the result and we can, you know, we can talk about it. I'll, I'll explain how it works, some of the steps involved. And then, um, you know, if anyone wants to know more or if things are unclear, like just feel free to ask questions in the comments and uh, I will, I am more than glad to respond. But so basically what we want is something that takes um, the Lindenmeyer string like the Lindemeyer system, and then uh, has a more general way of dealing with, you know, mapping, remapping the, the indices, indices to other things. So what I do here, um, this is just a thing that takes, um, this is just a, a thing that takes a, a, a yeah, we, we, you know, this function, it takes the number of steps from the Lindenmeyer system. It takes, you know, the actual string that describes the grammar, uh, the start uh, of the productions, uh, the length to, I decide to just fold in the, you know, taking a certain length of it um, at a time. Uh, we don't have to, I could just, you know, really let it be as unwieldy as it can. And, um, but I figured it wouldn't be a bad idea to just kind of let it, um, have have this in here as a safety parameter um and then and then so the targets that's what this is and the idea is that uh, this is going to be a list a list of well it could be a list of samples but as we'll see it, it really the way the way we're kind of doing things here can kind of just be a list of, of patterns um but as strings you know, not, not as the pattern type, but like the pre-formatted, um, you know, uh, mini notation syntax before it actually becomes like read in and parsed as a pattern. So you can kind of use that same syntax here 
in order to build your larger pattern. So what we're doing is we're mapping um, this function. So if you're not super used to Haskell, you know, this is this just a, a very common trick, which is sectioning. So you can see this C2I function um, takes the, and that's, that's character to, to index, basically. And uh, you can see what it, what it does is that it actually takes two arguments, which means if we give it one argument, it becomes a function that takes one argument and gives the result. So hence why we give it this first argument, which is the list of targets. And then, uh, then it becomes a thing that takes characters and returns strings. Cool. Well, that's, that's what we want. Um, like last time, we we're going to unwords at the end to put spaces in the proper places because that was an initial problem when we were doing this. Um, and you know, we I, I I forgot to put the I forgot to put the uh, the unwords and instead just concatenated the whole thing, and then that tried to you know put these these samples that it you know, just it just came out as like gibberish of like munched sample names rather than having them being separate and able to be parsed as a pattern. So what we have is um, the, the only complication here is if we see a number, we want to use it as an index into the targets. You know, just a, that's, that's all we're doing. If we see a rest, we need to return a rest because a rest is not a proper index, right? And if we tried to read it like a number, it would, things would just, you know, spit up and die here. We don't want that. So that's that's basically the logic here. We built the, the normal Lindenmeyer string, truncate it, then we take all the individual indices and turn them into, you know, we, we drop and replace other patterns in based off of this, this last argument here, that's just going to be a list of patterns in string form. And then we concatenate the whole thing together with unwords. So that's kind of, that's kind of, um, I mean, it's kind of a lot to, to take in. Um, and then, but thankfully after that, we have things that are a little easier. So we kind of have this uh, function here, it's just sort of a shortcut to applying the pattern parsing function to this result. And we have Linden Poly, which is the, um, which sort of combines all of the concepts here together. And the, the UI of this is not great. I will probably like refactor to make the order of, uh, order of, of upper, you know, sort of the order of arguments and stuff differently and uh, see if that makes stuff better. But uh, at the moment, this, this works. And what we're doing is, so this is another Haskell trick. Um, so the way I wrote the poly sequence uh, function is that it takes a string and then it, it takes the, the string for the inner pattern and then a number that's the that's the thing that goes after the percent sign. Now, that's, I like having the arguments that way, but for the rest of this, well, technically we kind of need the, the Linnemeyer pattern string to go first and then the, the, uh, the sort of poly, poly sequence uh, meter to come after that. But if you flip, an argument, uh, if you flip a, a function, what that means is that it swaps the order of the arguments. So this becomes a thing that takes the number first and then the pattern string. And so using our familiar uh, dollar sign composition, then I can just like easily have all this stuff concatenated together. And so this all compiles. Um, and uh, so yeah, here's, here's an example. Um, I'm going to put in some more um, spacing here so that it's less uh, onerous to read. But yeah, here, check this out. We have a, this is this is going to generate, so it's going to be at like a, a pulse of 10. Out of this 
monster of uh, a pattern string. And the pattern, the monster of a pattern string is um, going to, uh, oh, oh, <laughs> and another thing that's actually super important here uh, that I, I, I didn't, didn't see at first. So it would actually really, 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 really be bad if we did the, the take after doing this, this mapping. And if it's not obvious why, that's because um, here, where if you take, if you, any truncation is still going to be valid, right? It's because it's just a sequence of uh, numbers and uh, it's basically just a, just a sequence of, of numbers and rests. And, you know, we're taking a finite amount of that is just going to, it's any prefix of that is still going to be like valid to read. Um, on the other hand, if we did the mapping first, then we would have like things would be less regular in structure because you'd have like the names of, of sequence, uh, the names of samples or other patterns and stuff. And then this could end up, if you did the take then, it could just produce, you know, garbage. It could produce something that was like half a sample name in the middle of, or like, like half of some other pattern on the inside. So we don't want that. So that's why they have to be in this order. Okay, so going back. So what do we do? Okay, we go like five steps and then we um, take uh, we, with, with this production. And since I don't actually know how big of a thing this produces, I just take the first thousand because taking more than the, um, uh, taking more than the, the length should always be fine if I remember the way uh, Haskell works. Because if I do like take 10 of you know, one, two, three. Uh, yeah, it just retu returns one, two, three. It's uh, take take and drop are safe that way, if I remember correctly. Um, drop uh, will just return, if you do drop that's too big, it'll just return the empty list. And if you do take that's too big, it'll just return the whole list. So it's nice, safe operations here. Cool. So what this means is, you know, I just, you know, put a kind of a cap here at a thousand for the length of the pattern string. We start at zero, blah, blah, blah. This is just, these are just sort of arbitrary number sequences. I key smashed out. And then, so I go zero through three, which means I need four things here. Um, I kind of wish this is again, uh, if you watch the previous video and I rambled about wanting dependent types, well, one, thing that's kind of nice is that it would make it easier to ensure at the level of like the type system that this length and say like you know the number of things in here would have to match if we instead of using a string had some like actual um actual dependently typed uh syntax tree for the Lindenmeyer system it's totally something you could do um that would and that would actually be it would be pretty cute but that's not the system we're doing with. We're doing title, which is in Haskell, which doesn't have dependent types. I know people fake dependent types in Haskell. Um, I recommend looking into that about as much as, you know, reading the the, the Necronomicon. Um, it always makes me feel like I'm, I'm glimpsing into something eldritch and horrifying. Um, cool, but, um, you know, to, to reference something Connor McBride had said on these these topics, uh, they, they, they're more... Um, they're more cleverly dreadful than dreadfully clever. Um, not to, I hope I don't, I hope I don't offend someone's work, but they're like, it's so cool what people do, faking dependent types in Haskell, and it also is just like mind blowing for better and worse. But anyway, so we've got this whole function. And so the cool thing here is that it, it works. And so for example, the, you can drop in the patterns um, and, you know, you can sort of have them work. So this is, this should be either a clap or a glitch too, which is kind of a, a hissy static sound. And so, and every time that shows up, it'll be one or the other randomly. And if this thing eventually, you know, cycles back around, which technically it would eventually, um, then it'll still be randomized each time. So here, let's let's listen. 